Welcome to my talk, Addressing Wayland Robustness. My name is David Edmondson. I'm employed by Blue Systems. I've been working on Plasma for over 10 years. And over the last few years, I've been trying to get more involved in the Wayland ecosystem, just through Plasma and through our entire stack elsewhere. So Wayland. Wayland is one of the biggest transitions we faced as the Linux desktop. It's a lot of changes in lots of different areas, and it's important that we do a good job. It's not important that we do it quickly, it's important that we do it very well. So what's the current state of robustness? And what do I mean by robustness? So by robustness, I mean being able to handle errors. So I'm gonna cut across to a video of what we see currently. So here's my laptop um, running, running a compositor, got a text editor going, I've spent ages writing a document, and we're going to mimic what would happen if a compositor were to crash. Pretty underwhelming. Not only has my text editor been closed, it's been killed because we've switched back to the login manager. So all my content has been lost. As you can see, that was somewhat underwhelming. We don't see the same thing if Pulse Audio crashes. And whenever we're doing any application development inside Plasma, we try and build in a sense of robustness of handling these errors. If Power Devil crashes, Plasma Shell just reconnects if and when it comes back. So now we're going to see what happens on my laptop with a heavily patched stack throughout. Let's reproduce that scenario, but on my patched Plasma session. So I have kdevelop open, which is an absolutely massive monolithic Q widget application. And I've got my text editor. To, I've got some unsaved changes to mimic what a programmer is doing all day. I've got a system settings open, which is in QQuick, with multiple surfaces involved. And I've opened this to mimic what our users apparently spend all day adjusting. And I've got SuperTouch Cart open to mimic what project managers spend all their day doing. So now let's reproduce that same crash that we had before. We're going to pretend that Quinn had an accidental crash. And as you can see, everything has restored, or is about to restore. Come on, Plasma. Oh yeah, so. Um, and everything has restored exactly as it was before with absolutely no data loss whatsoever. My unsaved changes are still here. You can still see my characters spinning around in Super Touch Cart. I could be playing a level and not even lose first place. So what did we just see? We saw that when Quinn was induced quite aggressively into a crash, that everything was able to resume exactly where it left off. If I left the audio running, you would have heard that Super Touch Cart never skipped a single beat in its little jaunty jingle. We, we saw all my unsaved changes in KDevelop were exactly where I left them, even to a point of a curse position, because from a client point of view, nothing really happened. It was some the small internal reconnections, but that's it. And it's worth me mentioning that I didn't touch any of the code in KDevelop or SuperTuxCart or console or any of the client applications. We only touched toolkits and li shared library code. So I want to step back onto what problems is this solving? Because that's going to help explain some of the design decisions later. So the obvious one, crash handling. And I do like the fact that this person's first response into nearly dying was to upload a picture to Wikimedia under a shared license. That's very committed. So crash handling is the most obvious, most user facing part that we're going to see fairly early on. And I do want to stress this isn't a Quinn problem. I'm not going to claim any other compositors are better or worse, only that they all crash. In, in this screenshot, you can see some screenshots from um, Ubuntu's automatic crash reporting website. And there's Quinn on the left, and Mutter, and Sway. And you can't read out the text here, but each row represents a completely different, unique backtrace. So, Everything crashes, 
And this goes on for pages and pages. We've just got a first screenshot in here because that's the reality of software, particularly for something as difficult as a compositor. So how did X11 solve it? There's two very important parts. Firstly, it never really did. I'm of an era where I remember X11 crashing quite regularly to the point that it even shipped by default with a shortcut to restart it because it locked up relatively often, often enough that it decided a cut shortcut was warranted. And ultimately this has gone away, but only because they've been feature frozen for 10 years. And Wayland is not in a position where we can be feature frozen, partly because the specs are still being added to reach feature parity, partly because a lot of people are seeing the fact that the stack's open for changes again, and there's a lot of pent up ideas and experimentation that people have that people are wanting to push. So we're not going to be able to be feature frozen for a while. Also, X11 was able to do quite a good job of delegating responsibility to other processes, mostly because it had a somewhat lacking security model. And what we're seeing is because we're trying to introduce a security model, the compositive process is adopting more and more work, more and more responsibilities. And it's adopting, it's touching so many different libraries, so many different ways of doing things to reach the same result. And I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, but it is resulting in quite large applications to make a functional compositor that we that you need to run a desktop. Also, inside Quinn, and I'm sure it's true of the other compositors, we have end user styling, we have end user scripts, we have themes, and all of this concept of plugins and interaction and uh, certainly graphical drawing, especially on OpenGL, you get problems. We can never just hope that it all goes away. But it's not just crashes. I do want to stress that that might have been one of your motivations. It's certainly not it alone. So your developer experience is also quite frustrating. I mean, my personal Quinn never crashes because if it did, I would have been able to reproduce it. I would have been able to fix it. So generally speaking, people ask me about some bug that's been introduced in master and I won't be able to reproduce it. We get in a slight awkward state. And if you've got an uptime of several months, I'm not dog fooding what we're releasing. It becomes very problematic. And the whole testing developer experience is quite messy because I can run things in a nested session, I can run things against auto tests, but nothing has quite the same experience as to actually have it on your desktop as something you're working against. Another quite interesting feature is the idea of compositor handoffs. And what do I mean by that? Being able to start an application on Waypipe, which is like SSHX, being able to forward something to a remote server, and then move it to your local session, or vice versa. Or perform a multi-head setup where you have different compositors on different screens, and being able to then move apps between them. And this would get us to an incredibly improved state compared to what we see on X11. It's an opportunity to, to do something better. Another interesting feature is unlocks. I'm not going to claim it solves completely, but unlocks is checkpoint restore in user space. Catch your name, catch your logo. So Creo, what is it? It allows us to take a process or a bundle of processes and just freeze it to disk. So it's like closing a laptop lid, but on a per application basis. So if we end up memory constrained, or if you want to send something to a de developer to debug, or just move things between machines potentially, we've got a lot of op opportunity here. But a website makes it sound amazing until you read this slide, where it says on the Creo website in quite big writing, it doesn't work for X11 because of the very nature of X11. And all the reason it doesn't work against X11 won't work with Wayland the way Wayland is currently written. With my changes, we unlock this problem. And then hopefully we might see this on the desktop or potentially on Plasma Mobile where mem memory is even more constrained. It could be very exciting. 
So how have we done this? So your first step was to have a way of keeping a session alive when Quinn crashes. If we go through with a naive approach, if Quinn crashes and Plasma Shell and everything crashes at the same time, if all of the crash handlers kick in at once, everything becomes a very racy experience. Plasma Shell could try and start before Quinn has reconnect, recreated our Wayland Zero socket that it's trying to connect to. And then we're in a very sticky situation. We also introduce a potential security hole. If Quinn goes down, some other rogue composite will come in, create a socket on the same name, and then all the other clients will try and reconnect, but to this other rogue process, and we don't want that. So we make your Wayland socket on your file system. It's not really on disk. But on the file system, your Wayland dash zero file, socket file, we keep that alive. It's owned by a helper process, which starts up before Quinn, it creates a socket on disk, sets a bunch of environment variables, and then spawns Quinn with access to his file descriptor. If Quinn cr crashes, the socket remains. It's only cleaned up when everything exits gracefully. If a client tries to connect before Quinn is started, the client will just pause during that initial socket connection, waiting for Quinn to accept that connection and create a new file descriptor between them. This is completely race-free, potentially even improved startup speed because now we're able to start Quinn and start Plasma Shell at the same time and there's no race between them. Plasma Shell can do all of its linking, can do all of its heavy loading and only block at the point where it actually needs to block. So there's a lot of potential here. It's very similar to systemd socket activation, if you're familiar with that, except we did it ourselves locally for various reasons. Everything remains secure. You can't just replace this file from another process. You'd have to be able to mangle with the helper. Even a lock screen is secure. If Quinn crashes while a screen is locked, when Quinn restores, it checks the current state in login D, which has a Boolean cache of whether this session is locked or not. And the first frame Quinn would render after this is a lock screen again. And importantly for clients, we can distinguish Quinn crashing from Quinn closing. If the connection goes down, but the file remains on, on the file system, then we know Quinn's crashed, but we can reconnect. If the file connection goes down and the file doesn't exist, we know Quinn's exited, we should just exit gracefully. So all of this has merged. All of that part has landed in Plasma 5.21 and maybe even earlier. And you're probably running it now. And the experience I think is better than what we had before. If you log in, get a crash, you will now see your screen flooded with Dr. Conky dialogue saying, it's been an issue, my client has closed. But the desktop comes back, your panel comes back, you can then just relaunch everything. Good, but nowhere near good enough. So your next step, a slightly harder step, making a client survive. So I need to explain how Wayland works in an incredibly oversimplified way. Two processes just scream data at each other and both sides keep a cache of what the other person thinks the state is. There's no call and response, it's always just streams of information. So this is why we can't just keep a socket alive. We have to, after we reconnect, we have to resend the data. Because otherwise, if client just keeps the connection alive and then says, please attach buffer number six to surface number three, a compositor will respond with, what on earth is buffer six? And then just kill your client, which wouldn't really be what we want. So we need to resend everything. The other important thing to know about Wayland is everything is asynchronous because they're just screaming data at each other. The compositor always has a final say. If a client says, I would like to grab this, at some point, a compositor can just turn around and say, no, go away. And because of this, the clients are able to have to have code to react to this, which makes doing a reconnection a lot easier. We can just assume that a compositor is 
stop everything and just re-request everything. And most importantly, all memory allocations are in the client. If I want to send a buffer, a, load of con a picture of contents to a compositor, I create a space in shared memory, I create a file descriptor pointing to space in shared memory, and as a client, I send that file descriptor to a compositor. And the compositor is not creating any of the space. If the compositor goes down, the client can still read everything that it had before. And I think this is one of the, these are the big reasons why this wasn't possible in X11. If you try to introduce this in X11, you would have so many cases where you're trying to perform a round trip or you're accessing some data you've asked X11 to hold some structures it has. It just wouldn't work. But here, the client have, has everything. The client has all of the memory allocations and it has all of the data that it wants to send. It sent it once, it can send it again. I mean, for Rat Academy, I'll talk about Qt first. So you have your queue window object. It has your window title inside a queue window object. In fact, we create all of this inside queue window before we create the queue platform window. All of this is cached in the client. We have all of this information. So all we need to do is send it again. So I patched Qt and I made it do this. When we detect the connection has gone, we send everything again, everything comes back. So let's look a bit more in detail at what was actually needed. From a Qt point of view, we had to handle it as though every screen, every monitor has been disconnected and reconnected. We have to pretend that every input device has been disconnected and reconnected. But we had code to do all of this anyway, because screens changing at runtime is something that happens. Input devices changing at runtime is something that happens anyway. So we had all of this code, we just had to trigger it. We have to recreate the window buffers, so your, your content. And you have to do this from a client point of view at runtime anyway. Every time you resize a window, you have to create a new buffer of a new size. You have to be able to draw all of the contents in. And you were always able to resize a window. So we have all of these code paths available. We just need to trigger them. And lastly, we need to reset the shell. So what the compositor thinks a window is. And Qt actually has code for this already, simply because Qt API allows you to change between a pop-up and a top level at runtime. So we had to have code to tear down a window and recreate it. So we had all of that code existing. Now there is a lot of other glue, a lot of smaller things that I haven't mentioned, but in general, I was just accessing code that already existed and trying to trigger it. There is one exception. OpenGL, and this was one of the bigger challenges. The way this works is when we use a OpenGL library like Mesa, we pass a pointer to the underlying Wayland library objects, so it's WL display objects, really low level code, we pass in these structures, and OpenGL is making low level Wayland calls using this library. So we need OpenGL, uh, or Mesa, we need Mesa to stay in sync. So I patch OpenGL, I patch Mesa, and fixed everything. This wasn't quite as bad as I initially imagined. So we were able to keep the client connection to a render device, to a graphic card, completely untouched. We've, the client, at some point, gets authenticated, it gets told, oh, you're allowed to upload textures, you're allowed to do drawing. And once that's happened once, we don't need to do that again, even if the compositor goes down and comes back up. So your GL context remains intact and everything, all the textures and vertex buffers you've uploaded are all absolutely there. The only thing we need to do is reset all your EGL services, which we ask a client to do. And Mesa also has to reset a load of internal Wayland objects, a couple of factories and globals. This was quite invasive. We had to change LibWayler to do that. We had to introduce a new signal to say, I've been reconnected. Keep using the existing pointer I gave you earlier, but you're going to need to do some adjustments. 
So having done Qt, I wanted to try a couple of other toolkits because trying a few other toolkits helped shape what I did in Live Wayland and what I did in Meta, just to make sure the changes there are versatile and work for things other than just Qt. Obviously, I'm at Academy, I'm going to say everybody should be using Qt because it's amazing, but other toolkits do exist. So SDL, it's what SuperTuxCart was written in and you saw that in the video, I patched it. And the changes were relatively small. It was around 75 new lines to do everything. And once we've done that, we didn't have to change any of the SDL using clients at all. Just 75 lines inside SDL code itself. And that's relatively manageable. All of the changes were quite difficult. I'll be honest, this took me absolutely ages, quite embarrassingly long for what amounted to be 75 lines, but it's quite manageable. X Wayland. A patch X Wayland. There's a theme coming. So, X Wayland. X Wayland is a full X server that then has a Wayland connection for passing the surfaces and buffers and passing input events to your clients. But X server itself is a cache of client state. So, all we have to do is send all of that information again. And the X Wayland changes themselves were relatively straightforward. They're quite small, just resending everything. And again, I was mostly reusing existing code to handle resending um, a surface or a window, resetting input devices and such. But what was a challenge here is the compositor is also making potentially blocking calls into X11. Quinn can handle X Wayland crashing, so we've got a bit of a chicken and egg situation. All of the boilerplate around launching and managing required a bit of work, but we were able to fix it. Um, yeah, deployment's going to be a bit hard because we had to make some changes to X Wayland, but well, a lot of changes to X Wayland and how it interacts with your compositor. But the important part is it works. Firefox. Now, this is quite interesting. Obviously, it's been a theme so far. So, the next slide. I didn't patch Firefox. But, I was able to create something that worked quite successfully. I changed the .desktop file to be while to run Firefox. Obviously, because I'm a professional, I checked the exit code and did something slightly better. But effectively, this is what I was running. And I did this because Firefox already has amazing crash handling support. It can handle restoring everything. You have to press a button in the dialog, but then you get all of your windows back. So it's got all of this code available, and Firefox does some very quirky things with Wayland. So it potentially it would be quite hard for them to gain this research support. So I've included this slide to show we don't necessarily need to have a one-size-fits-all strategy. For Qt, it makes sense that your toolkit handles everything and just resets everything. For something like WL Paste, a small command line tool to paste clipboard contents, the best thing is probably just to exit. We don't need to have one size fits all. A strategy with a socket allows for a couple of different techniques. And I think a slightly better version of this might be a way forward for Firefox. Maybe not. Maybe I should have the full reset support. Um, Plasma Shell. Plasma is kind of unique when it comes to Wayland because not only do we have the common Wayland protocols that every other application uses, it has a load of really bespoke code for getting information about other windows, setting its own window positions. There's a lot more protocols and a lot more Wayland code. And I could have added research support here, or I can just let Plasma Shell quit and just bring it back using a crash handler. And we can still save everything first. There's not any risk of data loss because you don't really interact with Plasma Shell very much. So potentially that's a way forward for Plasma Shell as well. But what's the worst case scenario? What if I have an unsupported client? Uh, I haven't mentioned Chromium yet. Um, a big monolith application. 
or some unsupported case. What's the absolute worst thing that could happen if it did some quirky code, maybe if it does a round trip, making a blocking call that I said is one of those cases where we could fail. Well, the worst case is the client closes, which is what happens now. Nothing we introduce potentially makes the situation worse. Clients can opt into this and we can get a brilliant user experience. If clients don't opt into this, nothing gets worse in the current state. Obviously, we should still try and make sure Quinn doesn't crash. That's always a goal, but we have a backup. A, a fallback is that nothing gets worse. So to wrap this up, it definitely works. This is more than just a proof of concept. This isn't quite deployable le level, but things work really quite well. And I want to stress that no changes were made to your client applications. The K develop you saw earlier it was just absolutely stock. Not even any recompilations. We just changed the toolkits. Job done. Just dropping in new libraries. The changes are complicated. They are invasive. They're in difficult paths. But ultimately, they're not too big. I mean, that SDL patch is manageable. You could review it in an hour. Hopefully, this is something we can do moving forward. So, what's ne next? What's left to do? Well, we need to start off streaming a core changes, which I've been putting off because it's scary. And partly because I wanted to build up this repertoire of some toolkits that have been ported, just so I can make a case of these library changes definitely work and they work in this variety of situations. Um, I mentioned of patch Mesa in the OpenGL paths. I didn't patch a Vulkan paths. In theory, it should be exactly the same with a very similar idea. We just need to actually make those changes. Um, there's a few paths and Plasma integration where we need to follow up on. Effectively, anything that does low-level Wayland code, we have to treat it as though the compositor took away a global and that the global has come back. Or a certain interface has been removed and come back. And in theory, clients should be handling all of this already. In practice, they're not. One thing I hope to do in Qt6 is hook up some very generic signals into Qt Wayland client extension that I mentioned yesterday, so that it treats it exactly the same as a compositor removes an extension or a crash has just happened. And then you have an opportunity to reconnect with the same code path inside your client. So we need to follow up inside Plasma integration in a few places. And obviously there are other toolkits out there, GTK, Wine is quite a big toolkit that we want to have native support for. But hopefully they'll get jealous of what we're doing inside the Qt space and implement these changes. I have been speaking to one of the GTK developers who seems on board with this as an approach. And there are a lot of edge cases, potentially. I mean, the only way we'll find these is through extensive testing, but I'm sure edge cases will come up. I've been running the Qt restarting on my laptop since around February, and things are working generally just fine. But there have been some nuances. Uh, at one point, case screen didn't work properly. That's fixed now. But I'm sure we'll find others as we continue. When will I see this? So I've mentioned there are some Qt6 changes. And implicitly, that automatically makes it a while. So 18 months from now. But potentially, it means when we start moving everyone to Wayland by default, we will have all of this in place. So it's going to be a while. Because, especially as there are underlying changes that need to happen throughout the stack. And new API, which has to land before these toolkits can make use of it, which is always a frustrating chicken and egg problem. But we'll see what happens. Can I run this today? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of patches needed from LibWayland to Mesa to all of these toolkits, but it is doable. I'm not going to read out URLs, but if you look for my relevant blog post with the same title, you will see a set of links to all of my patches. So, any questions?
and here we are. Yep, I've had a quick change of clothes. Um, and now, yep, here to answer questions. Oh, Luigi's gone. Oh my goodness, I've killed Luigi. Fortunately, Mario and Luigi have many lives. Luigi, I can't hear you. While I wait for that, Kai sent me a message and asked me to just prove that Cute Creator works. So, Cute Creator, I'm going to do a live demo. Quinn Wayland replace. Oh, will it work? It does! Cute Creator! Oh! Right, I'll, I'll read some of your questions myself. Uh, Kai says, you mentioned custom Wayland protocols in Plasma Shell. Will this affect any client that uses custom Wayland code? Yes, if you use custom Wayland code, there are changes that are going to need to happen. I'm hoping we can abstract this so your path for our global has been removed and things have been reset is the same. And then from your client point of view, you just have to implement one thing. Uh, Nico asked, how does GTK behave? Well, right now, it will just close like it's doing now, which, as I said, it's no worse. I, I think, ultimately, we are going to have to convince people, we've done this demo, we want you guys to be involved, and then introduce this into Qt. Luigi, did you want to say something? Uh, no. Yes, so I guess you can hear me now, hopefully. Thanks. Yes, I can. Sorry. Quick uh, restart. No, no, no problem. No problem. It's, the, it's, it's a talk about restarting and not restarting <laughs> in practice, so I, I guess it's appropriate. So. OK, so Very I guess nice. you answered. I've, done, I've answered your top two, so, Kai and Nico. OK, so we have the other from Nate. Are there merge requests for these changes that we can follow? I guess you have not started yet. Also, I, I have branches that are pushed, if you can find them, in one with Lib Wayland, one with Mesa, and, and personal forks. I haven't turned these, uh, these branches into merge requests, partly because I was just trying to do cleanup at the time. Uh, Cute Wayland, you'll find my fork on Invent somewhere, but it's full of some QD bug noise. So it's, it's just a little bit of cleanup to do to get it to a less embarrassing state. I hope to do all of that before Academy. That was clearly a plan when the call for papers came about, but that is not how things work in reality. Oh well, no problem. It there will be there will be time, and it's good to hear that the other the other toolkits are at least partially on board with this, because otherwise it will be kind of um, yeah not complete. But it's ready. It's ready good. Um, there is another question. What will be a potential timeline for this work? to be merged? Well, it's connected to the previous one. <laughs> yeah, so especially as I said, we've got if we've got a cute six alliance that puts a minimum time frame on it, it's going to be at least a long time. But I think I think that we can still have this happen before Plasma moves to Wayland by default. I think doing a timeline based on that semantic level of before we move a default for our users, that seems doable. That's good. Uh, there is another question from Kai. I think that's, yeah, OK. You reckon we can make sure Wine's relatively fresh new Wayland support effort can already cater for this? I don't know sure, you know. why not? I mean, cause, I mean <laughs> it, relatively speaking, you're only going to be using a small subset of the Wayland protocols. It will be similar to adding, I mean, I said SDL was 100 lines. I think I said it was 75 lines. It's going to be similar for, um, for this. It might be more. I'm not going to claim how many lines of code something I haven't looked at is going to be. But it should be manageable. It should be ex exact same approach, amount of same workload. I like how you both of you are in matching t-shirts. Oh, it's the Academy t-shirt. Uh, explains it. Yeah. <laughs> 
I I have a I have a question for you, David, as well. Yes. I've been advertising our pub quiz and asking people to send photos all this event. Have you done it at least once yourself? You, um, you'll see which desk of mine because there'll be a me in the way. <laughs> okay, we are having this pub quiz together. We are the hosts of that. Maybe you can use this location to advertise it at least once? Yes, there will be a pub quiz Thursday at some point in your time zone. Look it up. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better advertisement. Well, you could. You wouldn't have got one. That was literally me trying. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so some helpful person just put a link in it. Oh, it's you. Uh, some helpful person put a link in the chat. Yep. Uh, okay. Are we done with questions? Luigi, did you find any any other? There are no other questions, it seems. Yep. So I guess we're done with this. Thanks again, David. And we can restart in three minutes, I think, three and a half, something like that. Restart. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And in, in those three minutes, we'll be hearing from Bjorn about how we can solve the personal data problem. See you in a few minutes.